2010. We're going to go to Rhode Island unless you sign the deal on the dotted line now. And you give Larry Ellison seven peers. Gives you know no money uh, required. We'll just do our best to raise money for all your costs, all that stuff. That's how we got into that mess. And I think that sold San Francisco short. And I think this pitch that um, you have to build luxury condos to get a little bit of public benefit sells San Francisco short too. Now we need money to come from somewhere. That's true. But we should demand much more. As I said, at a minimum, we should demand. I would think that real middle class or affordable units be built in any project. And if not, then it should be significant, not. 2% um, donation to the city's housing fund. But I also think that um, there is no question this, this lot, which is near the Ferry Building, the Exploratorium, is going to become something. There are not a, uh, a lack of developers or you know, maybe the government, but uh, could, in, in answer to your question, your first question about how could we make it more accessible without making luxury condos. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the city last November passed a parks bond and waterfront bond that paid millions of dollars for waterfront parks. I mean, that's an idea for this space if we, if we really want to. Um, but there are others. And the Exploratorium, I think, is a great example. That's not a free giveaway. That's a, that's a business that pays for itself, pays the port rent, and provides an incredible amount of free open space in the middle. You can walk through, look at the water. You can jog around, as I did this morning, um, all the time. That's a great model. Th this model of uh, ultra luxury condos for a little public benefit, I think, is selling itself short. And you're you had a middle question. No, no, I can't remember anymore. Oh, oh it maybe. Park. Oh, oh, it's parked. Thank you. Because this is the uh, this is absolutely not a transit first project. The the garage will be 330 something units, 320, 330 units, underground garage there in an incredibly congested part of our city. Um, and that's in large part because, and I did mention, the 134 condo unit owners all or almost all get a parking space. That's not. <laughs> When, when BART is so close by, um, transit first is supposed to mean we encourage people who are going to live in that part of town to use public transit. Outlawing them all to have a, a car is the opposite. And, that's, and then the loss of the, the competition and the congestion is one reason the ferry building has been very concerned about this project, affecting business all along. Um, but the parking is also an issue that a number of the environmental um, activists have brought up in, in opposing the project. Yeah, but it, it fits the transit policy and it's only replacing parking that is now accessible or has been accessible off of the Barkey area. So that okay. really supports the transit policy. Mm -hmm. So John and David can jump. You mentioned <coughs> an alternative might be the uh, Green Transit Center. Could you elaborate on that a little bit more? And then I'd like Alex to respond to the feasibility. Sure. I mean, I need. I, I bring it up. I need to present you with a plan. So I mean, if, if people here are interested, the Asian Neighborhood Design Plan is on, on the website. Okay. I can could, find it. You easily. could email us a to give you the details of it. As I you know, it was the process. I mean, that was that came about as part of an actual um, good process, which engaged the community, Chinatown, North Beach, people who live there, people around the city, to come up with a set of ideas. Engaged a professional planner, Fernando Marti, Asian Neighborhood Design and came up with some concepts. They're not, there's no developer ready to build it because we have to see what happens here. But I actually think that if the voters reject B and C, um, very quickly there will be, uh, whether the port initiates it or the community, a push to do something there. Because I don't think anyone wants to see this remain fallow. Um, and and you know, that would be an idea. And again, I'd be happy to share it with you so you can compare it for yourself. OK. So no one included any economic feasibility analysis in that study. And you know, that study, funded largely by Boston Properties, uh, was not trying to look at economic feasibility. It was trying to look at what would raise the most hope amongst the people who were opposed to this project. Uh, and as I said, the public's never going to allow anything to happen if they can possibly stop it. If they do, it would only be for the parking lot. The Bay Club. The members of the Bay Club's not involved in this. Okay, well, yeah. But uh, this plan that they have has never even been presented to the Ports Northeast Waterfront Advisory Group on which both John and I sit. Right, so we have to resolve this first. Uh, right, uh, th that plan has never really seen the light of day, never been presented to anybody for something that they came up with. And economic feasibility for a green transit center. Well, yeah, it sounds like a wonderful thing if it's got public finance associated with it. Who are Richard and Barbara Stewart? Where do they live, and what is their interest in this project? They're a couple that lives in the area. They moved out from the East Coast about a decade ago. They retired. They bought property. They live in Bullingate Commons. This is here. And their property values will be affected. That's 
absolutely true. So we're supposed to go out down to the map for a no. couple of wealthy people living in... I, I think <laughs> the Democratic Party, well, the Sierra Club, the Coalition well, for Neighborhoods uh, well, yeah, have I know taken you're asking position. all of us to go down to the map. I'm not asking you to do anything. I'm asking you to look at the proposition, yeah. and the people who have looked at it so far overwhelmingly have come out against it, the groups. But you should make up your own mind. I, I'm sure you will. Oh, okay, so let's join... Well, just, uh, I'm, I mean, they've made, I have a comment, they've made no secret of the fact that it's financed by those people. I mean, they have a... Let's find, they have, let's find a name of yours. And, and there are a whole bunch of us <laughs> who, who are against this, yeah. and it has nothing to do with what those people want. So okay, yes. Uh, I actually was curious about this, I think it was partially the answer, this Boston property is actually, I right. think, you brought it up, I don't really know. Do you, Do they have a... Are they for this because they have an idea of what else to do no, like that? No. I mean, who are they? They're, they own the Embarcadero Center. So they're like the Stewarts, their property values they see will be impacted by this. So they gave a significant amount of money to the campaign. They didn't fund the study, um, but they're, you know, property owners in the area are the major donors. We have probably about 500 donors now, but they own, they own property. So that's the same interest. They're not planning to develop something on the site. As I know. And they're also a developer of a high rise south of Marcus. Yes, not on the waterfront. So, I don't know, do you want to respond not to the point okay. of Joni's question? Yeah, that, um, right, and that comes 1,000 foot tall transmit tower, uh, the Embarcadero Center properties here. And one thing I really like to find is there have been a lot of endorsements for this project also. Alice supports it, Spur supports it. Uh, the San Francisco Building and Construction Trades Council, the Firefighters, the Police Officers Association, Chinese World Waterfront, Renaissance Westside Chinese Democratic Club, IBEW Local, blah, blah, you know, there's lots of labor organizations because there are many union jobs, you know, 250 construction jobs and 140 permanent jobs, engineering, landscaping, service, dining, et cetera. So um, there are, there's a lot of support for this project also. and. Um, there's been a lot of politics on this, as we all know. The opposition got out way early. They collected their 30,000 signatures through a combination of paid signature gatherers and volunteers. Our campaign collected our 26,000 through a combination of paid signature gatherers and volunteers like myself. Uh, so there's a lot of pretty slick stuff coming out from both sides. And I've been just trying to present a lot of facts about the project so you know as much about it as possible and can just decide not upon slogans, you know, twice as tall as the Embarcadero Freeway, I call that a real snake. Uh, because <laughs> what's the comparison, 10 not. blocks long and parking lots sun and dark spaces, uh, that really did wall off the waterfront. Uh, this, I have never seen how it's a wall, I've never seen how it matters how big the Embarcadero Freeway was. Uh, and uh, part of why I'm involved in this campaign is that I've thought it's so been so disingenuous on the other side. Right, okay, Max, <laughs> Who owns that property? <laughs> okay. The, the, club. <laughs> the land yeah. under the club is Bay owned Hill. by the owner of the Golden Gateway Towers. Right. Okay. And that's why a lot of people don't like it because he owns it and he's going to sell it. Yeah. The parking lot here is uh, is owned by We the People of the State of California. Okay. It's held and managed and trust by the Port of San Francisco. Okay. Uh, so the Port put out an RP for its parking lot, but it said that. Uh, it would accept proposals that incorporated the club also because many proposals in the past have tried to join the two together. And the parking lot by itself is an odd sliver of land that is not particularly marketable, buildable by itself. Uh, so the club is, was looking to have somebody, the, the project sponsor with their offices over here, and done this, they responded, committed work on stakeholders, and they proposed something here, and what they ended up with is this five and six stories here, eight and 12 stories here, one and two stories here, and park spaces and opening up the connections to the water pump from the city. Okay. So you know, is that your only question? <coughs> is this space available for people to walk through now? The club is not. Okay. The parking lot is. Okay, the parking lot is. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you, you're this is not called the blocking space. The, around, the area around it is. Oh. Yeah, you can walk around it. It's a, you it's walk around it's a recreation you, you club. Can, you can't yeah. walk it. It's a walk. No. You can't walk into the Bay Club and say, oh, I just want to wander through it. You have okay, to go around the back. That's all I want to be sure. Um, is there any, um, within the project itself, 
Is there any um, requirement or request or very strongly worded demand that we hire San Francisco's first for any work that's done within the project? Um, I don't know what I have gotten from the developer on that just to tell you what they've been telling me. Um, they have had major union participation in what they did across the street at Pier 1 and half 3 and 5. Mm -hmm. And what they said is that it'll, here, okay. uh, it will create 140 permanent jobs that include areas of security, landscape, engineering, maintenance, retail, okay. and dining, 100% committee, union labor, and other possible. They have a strong record already. The piers across the street renovated and managed by the same people. So all security, maintenance, janitorial, engineering employees are union. When they're able to enter into contracts with contractors to provide those services, whether or not they are union or really critical importance, they okay. have a good local record. Okay, fine. And good union support. Because yeah. a commentary, I get my two seconds of commentary <laughs> too. <laughs> but I, I just have a question. I mean, if you live in a project, if you live in an apartment building, you don't want people walking through. So saying it's gated doesn't really well, mean anything to me because I wouldn't want people, especially the people I've seen walking around the Golden Gate Bay and all this other stuff, okay. I wouldn't want them walking through either. So of course, if I'm paying $2 million, if I'm paying $2,000, I don't want people walking through. Right. The Security. issue the issue is that they are claiming their 51, the way they get to the 51% number, which I've done, and if Alec has other numbers, love to see them, they claim that over half, 51% of the project is open to you and me. Um, the reason we're bringing that up is they're including that in that claim. That's not open to you and me. They're including the recreation center, which is not open to you and me in their claim. They're including stuff that's already open to you and me around it in the little space at the top. That's why we bring it up. I, this is now being approved by voters. Isn't there some law that says anything that's approved by voters can only be changed by voters? Absolutely. Oh, well, that's what I thought yeah, was yeah, the law. The special use district, yes. The special use district that gets put into the planning code, the zoning code, <coughs> yes, that could only be changed by the voters. But in terms of how it describes the project, it describes it in ways in which there could be some modifications. But let me also say that uh, we put an administrative clearance provision into that initiative, which is in order to ensure that nobody circumvents the will of the voters in the same way that when the Board of Supervisors approves something, no one can circumvent the will of the Board unless it is the, the voters. We put in something to preclude appeals to the Board of Appeals, for example, because if either the Board of Supervisors approves something, like it had been, or in this case if it goes to the voters, then um, no other body of the city should be able to circumvent that circumvent that will. So that's what we have in there, that whatever the voters approve is what gets required to be built on the site if they want to take advantage of the special use district provisions of the zoning code. If they don't, if nobody wants to build this project, then it's the residential, commercial, combined, high-density zoning district that would apply to the site and to anything that somebody else wants to build it. So people could still build something else if they wanted to scrap this project. Like when I did Mission Bay back in the 80s, that project got scrapped and Willie Brown did another project there and what you see is what you get now. That's interesting. You know what won't change? <laughs> that, I, I actually never thought of the scenario where the developer won Prop B and then pulled out, which you just described basically or decided against it. What would not change is the height limit having been increased. That's if, if, prop, if both either proposition passes, but B, which is what the developer put on the ballot and what the real estate change, that is a codification by the voters of the height increase to 136 feet. That will never change unless the voters change it again. So that's a scenario I hadn't really thought about, which is if this developer changes their mind, or as developers sometimes do, have financial problems, and, pa and sells the rights to build to another developer, they could build a whole different project at the higher height without the amendment potential. Um, but I will say, prop, and prop B does lock in, unlike what the board did, every aspect of the project will have to be um, approved by the voters if it's going to be changed. So an issue that hasn't come up is the, is the sewage concern. And at the Board of Supervisors this spring, right after an addendum to the environmental impact re report came out, it was revealed through public records requests that um, a $100,000 report by the Public Utilities Commission revealed that there's an incredible danger, 60% in the, in the case of an earthquake, um, of damage to the city's North Fork sewer main, which runs right onto the project. And the reason is the developer apparently chosen to build 
there's a sewage line that runs under here, the underground garage within three and a half feet of the city's uh, main sewer line that carries 20, 20 million gallons of human waste a day. Um, the typical buffer is 20 feet. And so the PUC was concerned. There was this report that didn't come to light until um, citizen public records request got it out. So Supervisor Chu held a hearing. You may have seen some of the press. That's a real concern. And this initiative B, in particular, locks in the way the, su the sewage is done and potentially makes the developer not liable for any damage that's not immediately on or adjacent to the site. That's a concern. So I'm not quite sure how that answered answer Julian's question, but here is an active city of this portion of the waterfront that was given to both John and me at a Northeast Waterfront Advisory Group, and I'll, I'll pass this around. It shows that there are, in fact, the existing water main, a, existing sewer main that goes down along the Embarcadero, and then the PUC is in the midst of building another main that would be, it's called the redundant sewer main as a backup to that, which which diverges from the Embarcadero Main, goes along here, and then down Jump Street, crossing Market Street, et cetera. So that is the back at Main there, and the original plans were to build the underground garage wall pretty close to it, but the developer has been working with the PUC engineers and uh, is willing to move the wall back as far as the PUC engineers want it to go, and in the in Proposition B, it requires that there be an agreement with the PUC before going ahead with the project. So that agreement with the PUC puts the PUC in the driver's seat. Whatever they want to have happen on that site, engineering-wise, is going to have to happen. So, so that's that would, just so that would in solve the, yeah. That would in turn solve the issue that John is raising. Totally. In theory, it's a vague promise, okay. and we'll actually give the developer a hammer to say PUC. The voters approved a requirement that you come to an agreement with us, so drop your concerns, work with us, let, help us make what we so want to happen. Let's put the developer in the driver's seat. Give me a break. Let's, let's, Developer's let's, proposition. Let's, let's, they wrote let's, it. Give me a break. Tom? Yeah. Tom, you said at the beginning that if property passes, it will establish a, a new high limit. Right. I totally disagree with that logic, both legally and logically. First of all, property itself says it's not a precedent for anything else that's specific to that project. That's the language in the property. There's a legal, legal challenge. But even more importantly, if property is going to, it could potentially be represented as the will of the voters. The will of the voters actually is, if there's going to be a big development, we don't want, I'm going to, I'm going to turn this on its head and make it positive. We don't want any more than 16% of our, of our ground space. Because that, that over height on the building is 16% of that property. We don't want any more than 16% above height limits up to eight, uh, over 84, and, 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 and the rest has to be lower than the existing height limit, which is 84 feet. You follow what I'm saying? If there's a precedent, and I'm saying this isn't, it's that, that the majority of the space has to be lower than the height limit that is higher. Look at, look at, look at the whole area. Well, the way so how, can you, how can you challenge that? You that's a very fair, if you were the, the arbiter, Ultimately, if you're the person down the line who decides whether height well, limits should be increased, bad. I would have faith in that logic. But, but the way these deals work, as you, you guys know, is this is a developer and their lobbying team behind closed doors with the port commission, st port staff, or supervisors. And the developer has the upper hand usually because they've got the money and the promise of money. So the way the precedent will be used, and I've been fighting, you know, I fought off, I helped fight off the Mills Mall project, which was. Uh, a Willie Brown legacy project at Piers 2731. They were supposed to build a big mall, recreation center. They got it through the port, city. We fought it at the board. We won, but it was tough. Um, the way these work is the developer will use anything they can to hammer through their project. So I can, I can assure you, and I, I love your optimistic way of looking at it, that if this passes, the develop, it is an increase in the height from 84 feet to 136 on the waterfront, and it will be used for a long time to come as a as an example of why the port commission and other staff should let I'm other developers do it. I'm just construing the language of the public. It's it, it, it's I like it. It's called, it's called <laughs> it's strict it's creative. I'm saying what, what it actually says is not what, what it actually it says. says is increases height limit from 84 feet to 136. Okay. For that okay. project, which is what, it's what I described. Right, right. Okay. 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 Uh, do you have anything you want to say about that question? Or is that I think I've said enough. <laughs> <laughs> John, you want to say anything? All right. Okay, um, has anybody done any sort of um, um, projections on how um, 
these proposed buildings will cast shadows on the surrounding buildings. How will it affect the uh, views on um, the uh, buildings in this area and over here? With, yeah. um, because I was wondering if that could explain why Boston Properties would be opposed to it, since it would cut off um, these buildings' view of the uh, bay. Not on the, not on the buildings. The, the, during the EIR process, the Planning Commission did uh, you know, have to study the impact of the shadows. The shadow, there was a shadow impact significant on the park, on Sue Bearman Park. Um, on that strip of the park, there's now a playground there. The Planning Commission, as they've become, want to do, stamped it not a big, not a big enough deal to stop the project. But there is a s significant, was the official term, on the park. Um, I think, I mean, I don't know for sure, but I think the interest is, is allowing one developer to get a special exemption. Other developers see that as an unfair playing field. You know, why should they get a special height increase and we shouldn't? Um, and it, you know, that's my understanding of you know, what they're worried about. Okay, well, I'm sure China spent more chances to talk to Boston Coffees about what the motivations are than I had. But what I was assume is that they are losing some views from the lower levels of their office buildings. Not this one here, which is looking out this way, but probably this one they lose a little view looking out across here. They can still look sideways here. They lose a little of you there. So yeah, I think it's a business decision on their part. Mm -hmm. We can't rent these lower units, these lower office spaces for quite as much. So let's suppose that we can put in 100, 200,000 and it's no big deal in the big scheme of things because we are a billion dollar corporation. Uh, but in talking about shadows, part of the stepping down of these buildings going, let me just open this up for you. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't say that. Uh, it, part of stepping down the buildings is to reduce the shading on the area here. Uh, and the significant impact that John was talking about on shattering on this park here, yeah, it's um, adds like 0.001%. Uh, I was in your ear. Uh, you know, actually, the health care is a perfect example. The Republicans were, didn't want to give on the exchange because they figure it's going to lead to universal health care, which everybody's in favor of the law. But so the flip side of that is, uh, it's not necessarily the flip side, but it, it, it's an example of, you know, given the reality of incrementalism in, in policy, are, are, are you confident that that strategy would not be used here? Meaning, the idea that this opens the door now anybody can do the height limit anywhere on the embankment. Are you confident that, that this is a singular project and that the broad scope that John and many people could envision for being taken over on the um, Embarcadero and throughout the waterfront? Is that well, I am confident that for this site to increase the height limits, the amount that's being done here is not going to lead to any successful efforts by anybody to increase the height limits anywhere else on the waterfront. And people may try, people can try anything, but this is such a unique site. Uh, next to the tall buildings of downtown and the Golden Gateway Towers, uh, with a planning code policies that call for tapering down on a, on a site precisely like this, where those conditions are not gonna be anywhere else in the northern waterfront or in the southern waterfront either, right next to, I mean, I know a lot of people are concerned about the Golden State Warriors Arena, 125 feet on the bay side of the Embarcadero. This is such a totally different project from that, it's just unbelievable. Uh, and some other people are concerned about 75 Howard Street, where there's a parking garage that serves the ferry building now. Well, they're proposing there to increase the height limit from 200 to 350 feet, and there are no taller buildings like that right next to it. Uh, so that, this kind of thing here, this little bit of gradation in height limits is not gonna set a precedent for any of those other projects, and I'm sure that if this project passes that the opposition to those will be using the same arguments that I'm using now as to why it's not setting a precedent. Uh, it, it's just such a, different situation here from anywhere else. And, uh, you know, the urban design plan of the city actually has guidelines for the, guidelines for the height of buildings. And for this area here, it actually had much higher heights 
than or being on the waterfront projects elsewhere too. And using the ballot box to do it. I mean, that's where if the fight were just over uh, the referendum and what the board did, that's one. That's really a, narrow, a focused issue. It's it's much bigger because the developer, a developer, has put a piece of legislation before the voters and trying to sell it in in a clever way. I will acknowledge. And if that happens, that will absolutely be precedent precedent for whether it's a hiding a huge height increase, a small head increase, a project that's controversial for other reasons, um, and we might see things on the ballot. Soon. Yeah, but the opposition is even cleverer than that. I mean, if they can call this a wall in the waterfront and compare this with, oh, this is twice the height of the Barkyard Freeway, BFD. <laughs> John, just to, to, to respond to that, it, the, you know, Prop B wouldn't be on the ballot if you guys hadn't been opposing it. I mean, you, you may be shooting yourself in the foot on that. I mean, you know, Prop B, Prop B goes through and becomes a precedent because of you. So let's not. Yeah. I don't think we forced the developer to, to not, you know, the camp, their campaign could have been the same, but B. B is a you know, tactic. Yeah. So I, I, everything that needed to be said and has been said just about and let's, you, until you hear from Anand, but let's talk about money for just a second here. Um, in the old days, when we had a campaign, we were trying to raise money in the last two weeks, and John just said, we need to have money in order to get our message out. One fact about the poll that has not been said the good news is that we're a couple points ahead on Prop B. The bad news is only a third of the people in San Francisco are familiar or very familiar with the issue. That means two-thirds of the folks, some of whom are going to vote this election, we've got to get in touch with. John let me go on vacation last week. Nancy and I went up to Washington State and hiked around Mount Rainier. And I came back and I was really pleased. It was $7,000 in checks that had accumulated in the week that I was gone. And then I went online and I looked at the uh, disclosures of the other side and they had deposited one check in the amount of $70,000. <laughs> Yesterday, the developer deposited an additional $55,000. Now, while it is incredible, and I want to thank each and every one of you because one of the untold secrets of this campaign is I'm the guy who processes the checks. <laughs> I prepare the thank you letters that John signs and sends out. I, if you don't like the handwriting on the front of your envelope, that's my band. That band. <laughs> But we are going to have to step up the pace on money because regardless of how many people we talk to, we're going to have to communicate with folks in the mail. We're going to have to communicate with folks with banner ads on the internet. So when you're out there and you see somebody who's really enthusiastic, hand them one of those envelopes. If you've given, give again. 